We like the idea of living on a rotating space habitat, but what if we create alien ecosystems by doing just that? One of our favorite topics on this channel is space habitats and megastructures, particularly rotating habitats. Without having access to an unknown technology or planet-sized masses of material, the only way we can currently realistically create artificial gravity in a space habitat is by spinning a cylindrical or ring-shaped structure so that centrifugal force and inertia mimic gravity, which we call spin gravity. On Earth, ecosystems arise in all places, from sub-zero temperatures of Antarctica to muggy rainforests to sweltering deserts. In order to understand an ecology, we need to understand the context of its environment, as this plays a large role in defining what the ecology will look like. So a fish that has adapted to have antifreeze in its bloodstream, like some of those in Antarctica, would not do well if suddenly transported to the brine of the Dead Sea as its adaptations are to the cold, not the high salinity and high temperatures of the Dead Sea. So with that in mind, what would the environment of a rotating space habitat be like? These spinning habitats are often shown by themselves in space, even on this channel, but in practice you would almost never be able to see one from the outside. They are more likely to be inside of a sheath that's embedded inside a protective asteroid, separated from the sheath by vacuum so they can rotate without friction. There will also likely be superstructure and auxiliary facilities nearby. These structures are likely future homes of humanity, more so than the various planets that we might terraform, but we've never talked here before about what it might be like inside them in terms of the environment, ecology, and weather. In fact, most people are surprised to learn that an enclosed man-made structure would develop weather systems, but they do, particularly when the whole thing is spinning and Coriolis forces become a factor. Even if you designed a habitat to replicate Earth's environment as closely as possible, there will still be some major differences, and factors such as size, shape, rate of rotation, and lighting can radically alter the dynamics of an ecosystem. To avoid confusion, we will refer to the spinning section of a habitat as the drum. Another term, before we jump into today's topic, is the axis, the imaginary line down the middle of the drum, around which it rotates. The axis will come up a lot in this episode because it will be a fairly important and weirdly behaving place in our habitats. We often envision some sort of artificial sun that runs along the central axis like a cable, but the axis might also be an open space where you can enjoy zero-g recreation without a spacesuit, riding powerful winds, or drifting along slowly among the clouds. This is a key first environmental difference with Earth, as a drum is just a pressurized can. On Earth, air pressure is caused by kilometers of air sitting on top of more air, weighing it down. Gravity holds the air there and keeps it from leaking off the planet, even though there's a vacuum all around us. Inside a soda can, where the pressure is a great deal higher than the rest of Earth, it's the walls of the can keeping the material inside and the sheer quantity of gas packed in there that causes the normal pressure. Another difference in environment comes into play too. Stick a needle in Earth and the air doesn't go anywhere, stick a needle in the drum of a space habitat and it flows out like water down a bath plug hole. Needless to say, making sure punctures don't happen or can be patched quickly is an important part of habitat design. However, this also means that the air inside is not structured like on Earth. In a small drum, the air pressure is about the same at the axis or perimeter, even though the gravity is zero on the axis proportional to the distance from the axis. Halfway to the axis, get half the gravity. So in a small drum like that, plants and animals adapted to alpine climates with freezing temperatures and low atmospheric pressures wouldn't do too well unless the climate of the drum was specifically designed to be alpine. In the smaller habitats, the weather for the entire drum is likely to be the same, so very stable and niched ecosystems are likely to arise. 
I imagine that there would be all manner of habitats and somewhere, some place in the billions we construct, there will be any environment you could imagine, from the tropical to the alpine to the downright weird, like recreating ones with a high oxygen content that favored massive organisms, such as from the Carboniferous period. In much bigger drums, the pressure will vary with distance from the axis, and on the really big ones like McKendry cylinders, bishop rings, banks orbitals, or ring walls, pressure will vary with altitude like on Earth. The air gets thinner as you rise until you get to a near vacuum, but gravity remains essentially the same. Needless to say this results in very different weather than where the gravity rapidly drops off but the air pressure does not, and the mid-sized drums would be a bit of both, a big drop in gravity and pressure as you approach the axis. That also means on the bigger ones you don't actually need a closed habitat drum or ring because the air sticks there from spin gravity, but it can still spill off the sides and fly into space, so you need walls along the sides that rise quite high to prevent that, called rim walls, as opposed to caps that the normal cylinders have. One option is to stylize these as mountain ranges, and very tall ones at that, since while it's hard to breathe atop Earth's tallest mountains, there's still atmosphere there and far above, whereas to contain the atmosphere of our ring habitat, the mountain walls would have to rise all the way up into the vacuum. These are very alien environments as we have nothing like them on Earth. One can imagine over time that critters could evolve to survive or even thrive on the tops of mountains in a near vacuum. We already know that some organisms can exist in a vacuum too, such as tardigrades. I, for one, am excited to see what life in this alien environment will evolve. Who knows, we may even be able to borrow their exotic genetics for our own use in our crops, animals, or maybe ourselves. Even on the smaller habitats like Brian Versteeg's Kaplana 1 design, a cylinder won't have flat end caps. Sharp corners aren't structurally ideal, whereas a pill shape or a cylinder capped by a hemisphere on either end offers advantages. Those are still spinning but have lower gravity as you go up, and you likely stylize them as terrace slopes akin to hills or mountains. This results in an interesting difference from Earth too. On Earth, mountains have a timber line, a height at which trees can't grow anymore because of inhospitable conditions. You would likely still have these on the largest rotating habitats due to the changes in evapotranspirative forces, however on the more modest ones you might actually get the reverse. Gravity is lower near the axis, which helps trees to grow taller, but the air pressure isn't dropping off, and for a lot of drum sizes you will have a tendency to get higher humidity as you rise. Depending on drum size, while on Earth it can rain during the day or night, these would be more prone to raining at night when the light goes off and all the water vapor condenses and falls down as rain or snow. Interestingly, I've never seen a depiction of a space habitat with snow, but I imagine it would be quite spectacular, an entire artificial world clothed in a sparkly white winter wonderland. Redwoods, the tallest of trees, rely on fog for their water farther up, as it's hard to transport water that high. If you're on a cap mountain with a higher humidity and lower gravity, trees could potentially grow far taller than on Earth, with their canopy spread far wider. Imagine that sight, vast, interconnected canopies supporting their own layered ecosystems like we have in rainforests on Earth, but supersized potentially with two mostly segregated ecosystems, one on the ground, one in the canopy above. They'd be fun mountain forests to visit too, as the lower gravity would make hiking around much more comfortable and safe. I think your goal in building most such habitats is to mimic Earth as much as you can, but some variation might be welcome, and probably unavoidable too given the increasingly alien environment the closer we get to the axis. It's also fairly easy to make floating landmasses or structures inside the habitat drum. You just hang things from the tethers down from the axis. You'd probably have a lot of tethers hanging down as spokes anyway to ease transport around the place and put platforms for observation or maintenance on these. Birds would adapt easy enough to low gravity flight, and other animals might be transported up there or learn to climb or hitch a ride on the elevators. 
We have plenty of organisms living in the air too, and if the gravity is low, flight or buoyancy can become easier. You might get weird seaweed equivalents floating around the sky, patches of skyweed blown by the air currents in the microgravity. End caps are the best place to locate your mountains, since that would place less stress on the hull. However, your cylinder need not be smooth any more than it need be flat capped, and you can distort the habitat's hull to create hills and lakes. You can also use some light but sturdy material like aerogel to fill those fake hills, though for your typical drum, you'd have a problem keeping the drum structurally sound if you modified it too much. And even aerogel isn't so light you could disregard that mass if you were piling it into mountains. So you'd probably limit yourself to hills and valleys and say the mountains and canyons for the sloping caps. This also means that you are getting that normal feature of rivers running down out of the mountains into lakes below, and same as the caps don't have to be flat, the drum itself need not be a cylinder, it could bulge near the middle for instance, and there gravity would be a bit higher and you get a belt of water. You could also have one cap smaller than the other, a truncated cone, and on the skinnier end things would be a bit lower gravity and maybe a bit more arid, while the thicker end would be where your lake was that all the rivers ran down to. This inevitably brings up the topic of erosion, rivers cause it, rain causes it, and so does wind. Weather in a drum is normally going to be fairly mild, enough that you might need to take steps to get some decent wind and storms in them to support an ecosystem's seasonal cycle. However, this means that you need to take steps to maintain the interior, as even gentle rain or wind wear away at the landscape over time. Now the weather on such habitats will for the most part be similar enough to Earth without much monkeying around, but more mild. We focused on rotating habitats, but the reverse is true on bigger artificial worlds we sometimes discuss, like super mundane planets or mega Earths. The two biggest factors for weather are sunlight and spin. A Saturn sized planet turning once every 24 hours to mimic Earth, just a hundred times larger in surface area, is going to have some vicious winds, as would donut shaped planets like the Hoop World. Actually, wind speeds on gas giants are almost always in excess of the most violent hurricanes of Earth. On those, you can break it up by including mountain ranges for them to slam against and slow, and you can use this trick inside smaller rotating habitats to help funnel the air around to create more variation, and focus areas of high wind for ecosystems that need it. They can also be used to help vary temperature and precipitation if you don't want a single climate across the habitat. For that matter, you will also want to vary your lighting levels, spectrum, and duration to simulate seasons. Seasons are pretty critical to ecosystems, impacting everything from pest control to reproductive cycles, though one handy thing about such habitats is you can arrange those to be different in severity or duration than on Earth. The weirdest thing about the sky on rotating habitats though is that it doesn't exist. Look up on one and you see your neighbor's backyard hanging overhead. There's many ways to deal with that if you feel a need to, but the most blunt force trick is to stick another smaller cylinder painted blue inside your drum, maybe with lights in it to fake stars at night. You could stick a lot of fins and baffles on such a thing that could be folded up or extended to push the air around. Not really an elegant solution, but it does work and it would be pretty natural looking, even without getting sophisticated and using LED screens, it's not like painting a sky mural on your ceiling. Though if your sky cylinder is covered in a ton of pixels faking normal sky, day or night, I could easily imagine companies buying billboard time on those. However, you shouldn't need to go that route on larger ones at all, air distorts and absorbs light and water vapor does too. And as mentioned, in many of these it will tend to accumulate toward the axis in the daytime. You could get normal enough cloud formations and haze breaking up your view of the other side of the drum, and it might get a lot more since your artificial sun might need cooling. There's many ways to light a drum. You can let light in through the side panels in the drum, or through the caps using mirrors. You can have a big light bulb down the middle like a fluorescent tube. But if you've got a fusion economy, you probably want to have a big sun on a trolley that moves along the axis. 
Such a thing needs coolant and may use water as the working fluid for turning its turbines for power generation, and so it would be quite the cloud factory. Indeed that's what we call the nuclear plant in the town over from me, since it's always visible by the clouds the cooling tower was put out. Picturing a big white or yellow sphere on a trolley, trailing clouds, is probably not quite right though. In some you might have a noon spectrum lamp in the middle and red on the edges, pointing their light at an angle to simulate twilight. This would have the downside of having different times of day throughout the station and that might not be desirable. I don't really want time zones in my O'Neill cylinder the size of a modest island. In this regard, the big light bar stretching down the middle might be preferable. Everybody gets the same light at the same time, and you can dim it and change colors to do your day cycle. Doing that, though, has an interesting effect on the ecosystem of that habitat, as the angling of the sun that many mosses, plants, and animals rely on would not happen. This could cause rapid divergence in those habitats from the original ecosystems they were installed from. The Charlie Sun works better on a rotating donut habitat, not one we see much. We've got hoop worlds where you live on the outside of a very large donut, and we've got smaller toroid space station designs that spin like a hula hoop for gravity, but this is a bit different. On this type, it's the same as a normal rotating habitat, only it's quite long and has no cap. Those ends meet and it forms a hoop. To avoid confusion with hoop worlds or ring worlds, we will call this a circle habitat. It can spin like this, and not just around like a normal hoop. For the same reason everything is a rope, if it's long enough compared to its width. Even the sturdiest iron ball can be easily tied into knots and bows if long enough compared to width. The big brother of this is the Topopolis, the largest rotating habitat you can build with conventional materials, and the only one that can rival a Mega Earth for living area, we'll discuss those more in the future. For now, the neat thing about these is that if you have a trolley sun moving down the internal axis of one, it will rise and set just like normal, as it comes around the curve of the Taurus's interior, though you might use multiple trolley suns spaced around to get the right day-night spacings. You'd also get a steady breeze moving along with the trolley suns as they moved, so while these would seem at first to be more exotic than a rotating cylinder, they would actually mimic Earth's environment more easily. Incidentally, you're not necessarily using reflected sunlight or fusion power for these suns either. Kugelblitz black holes of the feedable type are ideal for fake suns inside rotating habitats or as sun moons orbiting artificial planets provided we filter out the dangerous ionizing wavelengths or convert them to other wavelengths. The amusing thing about using black holes and their Hawking radiation for lighting is that the bigger your space station is, the smaller the black hole you need to light it, since they grow more luminous as they get smaller. But even at the size of an O'Neill cylinder, the mass needed for such a black hole is less than that of the station. Of course you cannot throttle such things, they give out their power continually, though you might be able to reflect it back in when you don't want it. But you might have the same problem with fusion plants too, which might not be able to ramp power production up and down over a period as short as the day, and regardless, there's no night in space, for all that we talk of it being the ocean of night. So if you're getting your power to light the inside from solar or reflected mirrors, at night that is going to waste. You could have two drums, one lit and one not, at any given time that shared it, or just let it go to waste. But you could also store surplus power in the drum itself. You might want a pair of drums anyway, as without it the habitat could suffer from precession, which is the rapid flipping of the habitat end over end. That would be a nightmare for structural integrity of the station and the ecosystems on the habitat too. Alternatively, since a cylindrical habitat is basically a giant flywheel in a vacuum, you could slow it down a little, lowering gravity, during the day to augment your sunlight power supply, and then dump that power into spinning it up at night. It might be interesting to live someplace where the gravity was normal at dusk and dawn, but maybe 10% lower and higher at noon and midnight, get a little spring in your step midday, and be a bit more lethargic at night. Needless to say, that would do peculiar things not only to the weather but also to the ecosystem, and peculiar isn't necessarily bad. 
As we saw in exporting Earth, you'd often have to augment the food supplies for the local critters if you wanted to ensure they were numerous enough for both decent gene pools of any given species and a decent diversity of species. One interesting thing about these habitats would be their ability to maintain distinct species, like you see on isolated islands on Earth. While they aren't as genetically diverse, you do see unique species not found anywhere else because of that isolation. This can be an advantage, especially if you're trying to conserve some rare species of salamander, squirrel, or deer, and all things being equal, a simpler ecology is easier to maintain. The downside is that in order to keep the ecology healthy, you may need to intervene more to keep it on track, because the less complex the ecology, the less redundancy there is, and the easier for a single failure to destabilize the whole thing. Now you can have some complete ecologies in fairly small spaces, even a single petri dish, and even ones including more than microorganisms can be fairly small and complete, or close to it, but by and large we have to accept that any artificial habitat significantly smaller than a continent is going to have some gaps we'll have to plug with artificial means. We do have some habitat designs that big or bigger, and for those we have an easier time creating a stable ecosystem. You might need to maintain a gene bank to artificially insert diversity through cloning or genetic modification, or bring in stock from neighboring habitats. You might need to augment nutrients or fill ecological niches with artificial roles, like tiny robot drones that mimic bees for pollination. You might use bees or hummingbirds for pollination, but have to modify them and other organisms that navigate off the sun or magnetic fields, so they could navigate off what the habitat has instead. In small habitats, you might need to tinker with their genetics so they use something else, and it might be amusing if a habitat's bees and birds navigate off the Wi-Fi signal instead, which it would presumably have, especially since by default a cylinder habitat is a giant Faraday cage so signals from outside need to be received and repeated inside. Now speaking of bioengineering, all such environments will need constant maintenance by people, not just ecologically, but also mechanically, and for their landscape, and since the critters living inside might need some genetic tweaking, you might as well get them to do some of the work for you. This has some amusing implications. There's a theme park in France where they recently trained some crows to pick up trash, and while getting critters to collect trash and take it to a deposit site in exchange for food might be hard to do in the first generation, over time or with active intervention it could be done with many critters. One can probably engineer it to be instinctual if needed, but it's likely that for many species, after you train the first generation or two, parents would teach their kids what to do and which bits of trash are safe and what they got for them. I can imagine after some generations, squirrels fighting over cigarette butts or bottle caps as enthusiastically as lions fighting over a kill. However, one should hope humans of the future are not such little bugs they could support an entire species picking up their trash, so it's an amusing example that hopefully wouldn't be needed but it highlights how in these environments, doubly artificial by both their nature and them being human habitats, rather than dedicated eco-preserves, your ecology will either need tons of intervention, or needs to be adapted to include humans and our constructs as part of that ecology. And if you're not exactly replicating nature, by fundamentally adapting species to fit this artificial environment, it's worth considering using them as part of the maintenance crew. Let's take an example. Inside such habitats, you need a lot of rock and soil and things like sedimentary rock don't occur naturally off Earth, so you have to make it, and even things like basalt, which is common on the Moon, is a bit different than Earth's, whereas granite is not something you'll find on Moon's and asteroids and will be a pain to make. As it erodes down, you'd have to constantly replenish it and dredge your lakes so they don't fill in. One might imagine crabs or coral or other shell-producing critters might be tweaked to maintain the land by creating it, those are made of calcium carbonate and many rocks are mostly that too. With a bit of tweaking, while they'd still have their normal food chain, you could set up an ecosystem that's self-sustained far more than on Earth, by altering or maintaining the landscape too, much as beavers do in a way, in exchange for additional food.
As we mentioned in Space Farming, while you can obviously farm the interior of a habitation drum, you'd likely do most of your food production in simpler, cheaper, and more optimized auxiliary space farms near the habitat, so you could produce extra to bribe and pay the critters who can now live in greater numbers. One might also imagine how they might mutate down the centuries as they slip into these ecological roles and add new niches, more scavengers and pirates too. The hawk swoops down on the squirrel not to eat the squirrel but to steal its bottle caps, and the squirrels bury their bottle caps for the winter so they can take them into the recycling center for food in the lean months. Now of course all this could probably be done with machines instead, and maybe better, But on the higher end of genetic engineering and machine creation, the line gets rather blurry. People often say humans are the apex predator and the pinnacle of evolution and biology, which may be true. As we say here though, there is no machine on this planet as artificial as the typical human, nothing more man-made than us. So it's a blurry line and one that will get blurrier if you decide to extend this maintenance ecology outside your habitation drum. I mentioned that organisms can survive the radiation blasted ruins of space, and on the outer skin of the drum they might do well living just under the surface, same as something can live in the ice just under the surface too. We've already got ecosystems in the permafrost and glaciers on Earth, so it's not a stretch to believe something couldn't gain a foothold on our drums too. Also, again, the drum is unlikely to be exposed to the void anyway, but be surrounded by some protective sheath. Our preferred material for making rotating habitats is assumed to be graphene, which is made of carbon, we are carbon-based life, so one might imagine creating organisms which live on the hull and go around eating damaged and micrometeor scarred sections and replacing them with newly spun bits. They might be more machine than organic or based on an entirely different organic chemistry, but not necessarily. Again, we've got some very bizarre and robust extremophiles already, and often find new ones dwelling and even thriving in environments we call barren or even toxic. Finding things that eat plastics or metals or silicon or possibly graphene wouldn't be that weird, and as time passes, they will become more likely. Where evolution is involved, if there's a niche, a food source, something will eventually exploit it. We've now created a new ecosystem outside of the drum, one that might evolve into a very alien one too. This makes mutation a concern as well, because if you make a bunch of organisms that eat graphene hull plating and spin new bits, you will eventually end up with one that eats undamaged sections and others that adapt to eat each other. This would tend to happen with self-replicating machines too, and I should note that we can do things to curb their mutation rates, but we can also do that to biological organisms. There's no particular reason you can't build a checksum function into a robot's equivalent to DNA, one of many methods we use for data integrity when copying it, to cut down on mutation, and you could probably build that into normal DNA and biological organisms too. Though we have many methods to control such populations, like building in a requirement for a specific nutrient they can only get at one place, so they have to stick to that area, and it's easy to spot mutants when they come by. That's assuming you'd want to stop such mutation. Personally, I think that's fascinating and something we'd want to let progress. If things got too troublesome, you can just purge the current species, or build a new habitat. There's a habit in science fiction of having us come across artificial worlds and habitats abandoned by their makers or who went primitive. I think that's unlikely but it makes folks focus on how long such places would last without maintenance. To me, that's a bad way to look at it. The Earth isn't static. It's likely most planets that started off like Earth lost their atmosphere or oceans, and if they ever had life, lost it with them. Our planet has changed a ton over the eons, and is always changing. Mountains rise, oceans sweep them under, forests turn to plains and back to forests, then get swept under by glaciers or torched by volcanoes. Count it luck none of these changes ended our life, though it certainly ended most of it. We are mutant leftover survivors of those species that managed to barely survive many catastrophes that changed the world immensely and took most of its inhabitants off the table.
An artificial world would need maintenance in general, but if you're clever, you might make one self-sustaining, and even more stable and enduring than Earth. There's endless options, and while I think most habitats would try to mimic Earth as close as possible, I'd imagine almost all of them would choose to have at least one peculiar feature that stood out. Be it gardens in the clouds, or a sun that gave very long sunsets, or environmental controls that made sure it was always sunny on Sundays, or freakishly tall trees with enormous canopies spread out across the lower gravity sky, home to whole ecosystems living in those branches, or ones that incorporate calcium carbonate into their bulk and die as small limestone mountains, or squirrels that rob tourists of their chewing gum so they can turn their apples and gum in for treats. A little uniqueness never hurts, and who can say what other interesting things might emerge over time. We have a lot of announcements for today and we'll get to those and the upcoming schedule in a moment. First, I wanted to mention that while a big focus for today was designing the ecosystems on these habitats to match up well to human settlements, anthropic ecology if you would, We've also mentioned before that you could use habitats like these as dedicated nature preserves too. Some species don't do well with humans, and even those who do tend to change a lot, so closed off ecosystems helps preserve them against extinction and you can't get more closed off than a space station. However, it's surprising how often critters we thought went extinct turn out not to have, Lazarus species, not to mention just how many species we never even knew about, or at least that biologists didn't know about, and our sister channel Cheddar recently released an episode discussing that and how modern technology is letting us crowdsource our investigations. I'll link it in the video description and the end titles. They've been doing a lot of great videos recently and sponsoring many others like today's, and I suggest checking it out and don't forget to subscribe while you're there. I also want to thank Brian Vorstig of SpaceHabs.com for lending us a lot of the footage of his Kaplana 1 space habitat. He's one of the best space artists out there and has brought to life so many of the futuristic concepts we look at here. If you want to see more of those, check out his website, SpaceHabs.com, linked below. I recently sat down with John Michael Godier on his new radio show, Event Horizon, for an interview and as you'd expect, the two of us had a lot to talk about, so it ended up needing to be broken into two pieces. The first of those will air tonight at 5pm Eastern Time, 2100 UTC, which gives you plenty of time to check out Chettle and some of John's prior interviews with folks like Robert Zubrin and Andy Weir, author of The Martian, and our November Book of the Month, Artemis. We also have our second end of the month live stream coming up this weekend, Sunday, October 28th at 2pm Eastern, 1800 UTC. We may start bringing guests on for those in the future, but while we're still learning the ropes, I'll be there this Sunday afternoon answering all your questions about SFIA and our episodes. Lastly for announcements, while we have all the episodes available as audio only for download at SoundCloud and on iTunes, I recently added them all to Google Play as well. So we took a look at artificial habitats today and how their ecologies might change over generations, and we'll be looking at some more of these structures of truly grand scales in coming months. We do often spend a lot of time far ahead in the future, and a common comment made here by viewers is that they wish we could live to see such things, a sentiment I certainly share. With that in mind, next week we'll be joining up with Sen's Research Foundation to explore some of the science behind aging and extending the human lifespan, and we'll dig down into the biology and the other science of it next week. One thing we didn't discuss much today is how you turn barren asteroids you'd be making these habitats out of into good, healthy soil and get stuff growing there. In two weeks we'll be discussing how to transform our deserts here on Earth into verdant forests and lush jungles or farmland, and we'll talk about how you do that aspect of terraforming too. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell, and if you enjoyed this episode hit the like button and share with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.